Okay, we are officially live. Officially live. Okay. Okay, yeah, well, I'll wait a couple of minutes since a few people did say they would be coming. Sounds good. Yeah, I, didn't, I haven't heard from from Owen this month. I don't know if she's if she's around. Hey, hey, GD. Glad you glad you made it. Yes, Julie was rushing to finish it. I'm glad you finished it. Now you can yes. stay for the section. Yes. Yay, Owen is here. Yeah, we were just saying that we weren't sure whether you're going to make it this month. We're very glad to see you, as always. Yes, yes. So I'm going to have two more people who definitely said that they would try and make it. Um, so we'll give them a couple of minutes since we are on time this month. Um, <laughs> no wonder people aren't here yet. Like no one expected us to start on time. <laughs> I can't blame you guys. So yeah, and like I was saying to Kara um, just before we went live, I'm hoping that this will be a fairly free form discussion. Um, I've got some points, but feel free to pitch in with any comments you have at any point, even if they feel tangential. I'll go ahead and do um, a follow up tweet because I realized I didn't do one once we actually went live. let's let's make a start with introductions um and people if they are coming can trickle in um so hey everyone um welcome to this month's discussion on a face like glass which hooray we're finally back to the books that have only one title um, <laughs> um yeah cara do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your history with this book sure so hi everyone i'm cara obviously my channel is wild book garden because that's where we are um, I'm pretty sure I was just looking at Goodreads and I'm pretty sure this was the first Frances Harding book I read, um, which was way back in 2015 and I loved it. And, um, I think I've read it at least, this is at least my third time reading it, possibly like fourth. Um, and it's still one of my favorites from her. Um, so as we have been warning everyone consistently, this is just going to be us gushing about how much we love this book. Um, 
yeah, so I, I don't really know what else to say. I, I love everything about this book. I think it is like one of the, this one in Goldstruck Island, I just think are like perfectly executed fantasy books. So I'm excited to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm Hannah um, and this is also, this is also my third time reading this one. I, I read it in the general phase when I was reading all of the books that she had out at the time that I was reading them, um, which was about, I think I was about 14. Um, and I feel like I, th that age changes every month when I say it. I can't remember when it was um, <laughs> at some point. Um, but yes, I this of, of all of her books that I've read so far, this one is my favorite. Um, yeah, I read it three times and I, like Cara said, I love every single thing about it. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so yeah, you have been warned. Um, <laughs> Yes, and before we get into the discussion, I will go through the content warnings, which I think for this one are murder, abuse, family separation, grief, execution, and kind of mentions of captivity and incarceration. Um, so yeah, like Gelsrock Island, it's quite a heavy one. But and then yeah, so we've done we've done general thoughts. Um, but anything else you want to say, just off the top. Um, I feel like, I feel like Frances Harding just had so much fun with this one. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I feel like happens every time I reread this one is I'll forget for a while in the middle that it's like very loosely in Alice in Wonderland retelling. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be just tiny details that I'm like, oh my God, that's so smart. And then like, cause it's not a retelling, but it is a tiny bit. And just, mm -hmm. it's like a fun little scavenger hunt getting to like, find those things. So I, I really enjoyed that this time around as well. I was like, this is so smart and like, so subtle. Like she's just throwing in little tidbits where like, if you do know the original story, you're going to have fun with it. But I don't think it's like, like, if you don't like Alice in Wonderland, you could still really enjoy this book. Yeah, I don't think I knew. I only found out recently that it was even attempting or like, suggesting that it was in any way related to Alice. I think this was my first time reading it, knowing that and you, you can see the, the inspirations in some places but yeah like you said it's it's definitely subtle yes this is the book that i have been shouting about for years <laughs> um so i'm glad we're giving people an excuse to maybe read it yes um yeah and so i think we usually start with characters but i think that'll get spoilery quite fast so i think we'll start, start with the world this time um so just general thoughts on the world I really loved it. Um, I love how whimsical and strange it is, but it still has an internal logic, um, which I think is really hard to do. But it like makes sense, even though there's these weird things that shouldn't make sense. Um, and I also like, I don't like stories that take place underground. So the fact that I love the setting of this one so much, I think is just a testament to like what a good writer Frances Harding is. Like you definitely get the sense that it is underground, but it's not in, maybe maybe it's just that I enjoy her writing so much that even when she's just describing things I wouldn't normally like, I'm like, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy the setting and how it works with the, the magical aspects, like the true delicacies and just like this strange world that, um, that you, you get to find out a little bit more about it, like throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It like it, it's very clearly underground, but it feels like bright and vibrant at the same time, mm -hmm. which I think contributes to it. Not, doesn't feel so kind of claustrophobic um, in some ways, and yeah, it's so creative. I love, like, like we've been saying every month, the way she like really thinks things through all the way to the end. Like the trap lanterns, like yes, you could use it as a scuba diving tank because, yeah. like, yes, it would show that there's someone alive. Like, you think it's just a lantern, but there's, you know, the yeah. There's so many more consequences to that. And I love the way she's considered all of them. And like the instinctive fear of the dark that everyone has in Caverna, because it doesn't just mean the dark, it means you have no air because light means air. And like how that means that like the poorer areas of the city are really bright because there's so many people packed so closely mm -hmm. together that they have a ton of trap lanterns. Like I just, yeah, I just think she really 
she thought out everything, you know, as we've been saying for all the books is like, she's just really good at consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like just the deep, like this is a tiny ridiculous point, but the bit where Neverfell sees a giraffe um, and they say, yes. oh, it got that, its neck is that long because it was reaching for the leaves. And that actually was an evolutionary theory that was put forward. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, of course you would include that, of course. Yeah, the camel leopard. <laughs> Yeah, like it's it's not um yeah, I think I never knew it was Lucy Jake Tallis in Wonderland. It's not kind of obvious at all. Yeah. Which, and I think it's interesting that she did that because she's very like if you read interviews with Frances Harding, she's very um conscious, I guess, about like not wanting her work to be derivative, but wanting to make sure it's all original. Um so I think it's interesting that she chose to do a not quite retelling um i didn't yeah have a chance to look up interviews with her i do try to sometimes but i wonder what inspired her to to do that yeah like i do have this on my retellings shelf on goodreads because there are connections but i i don't think of it as a retelling i almost think of it more as like a fantasy book that has fun bonus material if you've read Alice in Wonderland because like the things that she includes are a lot of times are so small like okay there's the part where Neverfell follows a white rabbit like that's a pretty clear reference that I think is um one of the more overt ones but there's like one of the things I marked that I thought was there's some of these words like I don't remember if I picked up on this before because it's so subtle but um when she's at when Neverfell is at a banquet and everything is so like beautiful and rich and like the the dishes are brought in with so much ceremony that it says never fell had like the vague impression she should get up and curtsy to it and that's a scene in i think alice in wonderland or through the looking glass i don't remember which one but there's a scene where she's at a banquet and she keeps getting introduced to her food mm -hmm. and then she can't eat it because it's like once you've been introduced you're not supposed to like eat the food and just like little things like that where it doesn't affect the overall story too much but it's just like oh if you know Alice in Wonderland these are really fun things to like pick up on mm -hmm. yeah and even with the like drink me wine mm -hmm. you know is the, is the obvious one yes yes um, yeah and let's talk about um while we're on the world let's talk about the faces um thoughts yeah I I love that aspect um I think it's such an interesting concept and one of my favorite things about it which I know we'll get into when we talk about themes is like the way the number of expressions people have is used to reinforce class mm -hmm. um and I just think this like I love I love the things that this book says about like emotion and like anger and how being able to show that you're angry is really important mm -hmm. um yeah, and I just I think it's really interesting too, like the the fa the fact that everybody except Neverfell has to wear these manufactured faces. I think it just is really interesting in connection with um, being able to trust people and what makes you trust people. And um, yeah, I don't have a lot of co coherent thoughts about it. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I agree. And like thoughts on the faces as a comparison, or thoughts on the fact that the dredges have limited faces um, in comparison with the lace smiles. Um, so mm -hmm. for, for Julie and for anyone else who might be watching this, um, who in Gullstruck Island, which was our book last month, the the ladies who are a kind of second class people in that world um, are constantly smiling. Um, so thoughts, I don't know, I've never really thought about the connection before, but I don't know, reading them back to back just made me think about the fact that she chose to do that in two consecutive books. Yeah. I that's really interesting I didn't think about that until you brought it up um one thing that it makes me think of is like in this in a face like glass limited expressions is a way to control people whereas in Gullstruck Island the lace being able to choose to use their smiles is a big deal so it's I think it's more about getting to choose what your what your method of expression is like rather than like everybody should be able to um or like everybody has to express things in the same way. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't think about those things in connection with each other, but they're kind of like opposite examples of the same idea, which is that you shouldn't force people to express themselves a certain way. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is unique. It's a, yeah. I've never read another book that does something similar. But yeah, it was just a. I don't even know if I marked the quote. I should have pulled it out before this, but there was a particular. I think it was a moment when Neverfell's talking to Erstwhile, um, and notices that, you know, that she really doesn't know what he's saying or that his face doesn't match what he's feeling. Um, that just made me think about the moment in Gulfstrap Island where she's talking to the Duke, um, and the Duke thinks she's grinning and happy, yeah. when actually she's terrified. Yeah. Um, I think also one of the things that makes this book so effective is I have no trouble believing that this is what would happen if we were in a society where like we did have to learn faces like this. It's like, absolutely. If you were poor, you would not be able to learn the same number of faces. And it would uh, just like the way that that's used to like dehumanize the drudges and everything is, um, yeah, it's, it's just like, something we brought up before is Francis Harding is clearly very good at understanding human nature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, sadly, there is no doubt in my mind that um, this is kind of the direction things would go. Um, hopefully with the the better outcomes as well, but. Yeah. And that's, so yeah, so while we're there, let's talk about the themes of as well. Yes. Um, you talk about um, the the whole thing of collective anger and class and yeah, um, I I thought that was fantastic and it was even like it's been a few years now since I read this one for the last for the last time so it's even better than I remembered it being like it's it's such a smart book um, and there's that part where like the first time that Neverfell actually goes down to um, the Undercity and she has that moment of kind of buying into it where she's like, oh yeah, like they don't look like people. Like maybe maybe the nobility is right and these aren't really people. And then she has that shift of like, no, they're made to look like this. And it's a very deliberate. Mm -hmm. And um, that part where she sees some of the drudges go up to the foreman because the girl just like, you know, fell to her death. And they're trying, It's it looks like they're going to stand up to the foreman but then they look at each other and it doesn't look like anyone's with them. Um, so kind of like what you were saying about like collective anger and like being able to see that other people are angry about the same thing mm -hmm. you are and how important that is. Um, I I just thought that was fantastic, like really well done. Yeah, definitely. And the whole, like, because it's so intentional as well. You're, you're right. <laughs> Sorry, I just messed up my yeah. headphones. What was that last part? I'm sorry. Um, the idea that it's it's so intentional because like Madame Apolline explicitly says to never felt like, yes, and if they had faces, then they would feel that they were sad and we can't have that. Um, yeah. It's so, you know, it's so deliberate. Yeah. The way and that I, they're doing that. Kind yeah. Of. And I think it. she did such a good job like walking that line where she shows how important it is to be able to like name and express what you're feeling like in order to do something about it but it doesn't feel like like we, we can see that the drudges do steer, still clearly have these emotions like they are angry and they are upset and they are hurt and it's like they're trapped into not being able to express it but it doesn't mean they don't have those feelings you know um like it's not like neverfell gives them <laughs> the ability to, f to feel anger um which i like And it all, are your headphones all right? Okay. Are your headphones okay? Yes, sorry, I had to, had a momentary technical difficulty. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, the way the way that the whole thing with the face and the draw just plays into that. And um, Francis Harding's clearly very interested in like power and manipulation and the way people treat each other. And I feel like that's a running theme through all of the books. Yeah. Um, but I feel like it's, I don't know, in some ways it's particularly sharp in this one and, and Girls from Island too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, it's probably, probably not an accident that these are my two favorite books from her because I feel like they're the ones that um, deal with that most directly. Like, not that her other books don't do it, but like with Goldstruck Island and with A Face Like Glass, it's like, 
the entire like plot and story and setting and like everything that she put into the book is about these issues. And um, I just think she did a great job with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think, um, I think it's interesting that this, so Twilight Robbery, which we read out of order, was published in between Girls from Highlands and this one. Um, oh, yeah. Which I didn't realize until I was just looking it up for this. Um, because that also deals thematically with power and so you know clearly in that stretch of years it was something that she was very she was interested about a lot yeah that's a good point I'm glad you brought that up yeah and do you want to talk about the kind of the general structure so it's still without spoilers but kind of the general way the plot, plot is constructed yeah um as, as we say with all of her books, it's like, how do you summarize <laughs> this book? Because so much happens. And I feel like the, the like, what if Alice grew up in Neverland and had to, or Wonderland, sorry, not Neverland, um, and had to find her way out. Like, I think that's a good hook. And it gives you a sense of like the whimsical setting and everything. But as we've talked about, it doesn't really indicate the story. Um, and I, I really liked, I really liked the way the plot went. I like that we get to spend so much time with this really weird court setup um, and like the grand steward yeah. and everything. Yeah, Judy's saying it was interesting having yeah. you. We will get to the grand steward. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was fascinating. Um, I, I, it's hard to talk about the plot without talking about other stuff as well, like with Neverfell herself and how her learning more about the world is also her like growing as a person and, um, yeah, I, I just found the story very compelling. I found it to be a very quick read. And there were parts where I didn't remember, like there were so many parts of this book that I didn't remember. So we'd come up to like another reveal and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I thought the story itself was like really compelling. Um, I also was impressed because there were parts of the plot where they maybe wouldn't have, they don't, they're not things that I think of as being interesting. Like, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Like, I don't, obviously I don't like travel stuff and not that there's like a lot of travel in this book, but some of the like, um, trying to find a way out or trying to, uh, just like a lot of the geography stuff normally wouldn't interest me, but I think she did it in a way that was really interesting, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think this is, of the ones we've read, I'd argue that this is maybe the most complicated plot-wise, um, aside from possibly Fly By Night. Um, and it's much, <laughs> it's much, I'd say it's better constructed than Fly By Night in terms of the way the plot is, the mystery is revealed. Um, yeah. And yeah, it is, it is a long book. Um, I think it's the longest of her books. But um, yeah, it doesn't, it feels like it moves quickly. Um, yeah. And it, because the reader has no idea what's going on for 90% of the book. <laughs> yeah, and she does that without it being annoying, which I'm so mm -hmm. impressed with. And the fact that, that like so much of this, um, there are certain plot points that really hinge on characters remembering something or not remembering something. And I think that's something that can feel very annoying, but it never did for me. Um, even the places where I don't remember how things turned out, I was just so impressed at how meticulously she must have plotted all of this that I was just along for the ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Owen's saying that it was complicated but yeah. in a great way, like the tunnels, um, which is a great comparison. Um, yes. And also I, I feel like what you're saying about the geography being less annoying, the fact that Caverna is alive and kind of feels more like a character than a place in some ways maybe contributes to that, that it's not, you know, it's more than a setting, it's yeah. yeah, it has its own personality in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about um, speaking of things which are, which should be annoying but aren't. Um, <laughs> never fell. Never fell. I was like, are you going to ask about the main character? I I think I love her more every time I read the book because I remember the very first time I read it, it took me a while to warm up to her because you just wanted to be like, never fell. This is clearly a bad idea. What are you doing? And she just like goes full steam ahead, um, so sowing chaos all the way. But I love her and I, I love that 
I don't know if I can say this in the spoiler free section. I guess I'll wait. Um, I, I love the faith that she has in people and how we see her becoming wiser, but she doesn't lose that goodness and that optimism. And like one of the things I thought while I was reading this one is like one of the big, um, I feel like establishing character moments for Neverfell happens at the Grand Steward's dinner where she helps that servant. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized like when I got to that part this time, I was like, that's why I love all of Frances Harding's characters is because all of the ones I think that we've read so far, <laughs> they would all do that. Like instinctively, they would all help that person and they would do it in different ways. Like Hathen would probably do something very quiet. She just like put a plate over the stain or something. Um, Moscow would like set Saracen loose in the cavern to distract everyone. Like Ryan, I'm sure would do something kind of like mm -hmm. happen. Where, so like, I just love that all of her main characters have this, um, this, this moral compass that they act on mm -hmm. in different ways. But yeah, I just, I love her. And I, I love that her books, that Frances Harding's books are like such a good example of how you can have good people as main characters who are still interesting and who still grow. Um, and who still have difficult choices to make. So yeah, I, I ended up really loving Never Fell by the end of the book. And it, it takes me less and less time to fall in love with her every time I reread this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I am saying as well mm -hmm. that she's annoying like, warmed up to her. And yeah, that she's so naive. Um, yes. <laughs> and in a way that I like, I feel like it would be frustrating in any other character, but mm -hmm. just how something somehow manages to, I don't know how she manages it. Um, I know. But, you know, um, she can pull off anything. Uh, but, and yeah. I feel like the other characters in the book have the same reaction. They're like, you are an idiot. Why do I love you? <laughs> yeah, because she's she's so naive and so trusting. And you think every time you think that surely you'll learn your lesson now, now after this person's betrayed you and this person's betrayed you, and she just keeps trusting everyone, and which I feel like is is a failing under strength um yeah when she keeps opening those boxes i'm like <laughs> i would have given up after like the first one <laughs> yeah and then she's... she isn't there's a quote the grant student is like most people open one or two only an idiot would open one. <laughs> yeah it's just it's like she's she's a painfully optimistic person in the face of all evidence and as you said i think that's like a weakness but it's also one of her greatest strengths and I love that she doesn't lose that. It sometimes drives me up the wall, but <laughs> I love that she is still that person. Yeah. And like and she's also incredibly intelligent, like maybe mm -hmm. not when it comes to people, but in terms of, you know, machines and and just, you know, making connections and working things out. She's very, very clever. And I love the moment where she realizes that her, like that that's her real strength. Um Yeah. That it's not just her face that she has nothing to do with. Yeah, I love that. Um, I don't think we can talk about any of the other characters without spoilers. Um, so is there anything else that anyone wants to say before we go into the spoiler section? I was going to, the other thing I was thinking about having us do was rank them, rank the books we've read so far because we're halfway through now, which is wild. Um, yeah. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, I can't, I can't. Rank. I know. <laughs> I'm not going to try and make us do this. I know. <laughs> um, I still like, it's one of those things like while I'm reading Gullstruck Island, I'm like, this is my favorite. And then while I'm reading A Face Like Glass, I'm like, no, this is my favorite. Like I have like tiers of, of books from her, but yeah, I could not. I could not do that. <laughs> okay. So if not, no one has anything to add, um, let's go into the spoiler section. Um, let's talk about, is there anyone you particularly want to talk about first? Um, well, the one, the thing I was going to say about Neverfall that was spoilery is I love <laughs> that she just like aggressively believes the best of people and that like <laughs> it actually... Like she believes the best even when there's no evidence for it and by doing that she turns people good with like her optimism and like yeah so i guess kind of the one i think is most obvious with that is zuel so i don't know if we want to like start with her yeah. but 
Yeah, let's start with her. She was first on my list as well. She, yeah. every time Neverfell tried to make friends with her, my heart just hurt for Neverfell. I was like, why, why do you keep putting yourself through this? I know. And this is like another example of, um, even though I've read this several times, like we meet Zuel for the first time and I'm like, ugh, like she's clearly like manipulative. Like she's using people. She doesn't actually have friends. She just like gets people to do things for her and makes them think she's friends with them. And yeah, just, just every time Neverfell would like forgive her and be like kind to her. And Zuel's like, why are you doing this? She's like, I don't like you. You're not my friend. And Neverfell's like, you are though. <laughs> and it works. Like that's what like gets me is, like obviously I think Zuel is responsible for her own choices, but I just do feel like there is um like Neverfell plays a really important role in that she she won't let go of the possibility mm -hmm. that Zuel can can be good and can do the right thing. And she she just like believes her into it, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And when do you or do you have a, a thought for when when Zuel starts to be good and starts to actually care about Neverfell, because I was thinking about this when I was reading it this time, and I feel like I couldn't pinpoint the the moment at which she decides that actually no, I do care about Neverfell. She's not just this annoying thing I have to. I, yeah, I kind of think like when before we find out what she did we see that she's upset about something she did and then like that's when her and Neverfell have that discussion in her lab um about the like the whole memory thing which I did not remember there were some clues I picked up on I was like well something's weird here but I didn't remember that um so that was a fun surprise again <laughs> um but yeah I think the point where Zuel starts realizing she does care about Neverfell is when she goes through with the memory thing and then she feels horrible about it. But I think the thing that really solidifies that is when she tells Neverfell and Neverfell still forgives her and is like, I'm sorry that you felt like you had to do that. And Zuel's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, I just betrayed you. And Neverfell's like, you're still my friend though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I like really was invested by her by the end. I like didn't want anything to happen to her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I kind of felt like she was warming up to her before the the whole incident at Madame Athelene's, um, but then she still goes through with it anyway, mm -hmm. um, which I think is sort of interesting and important because she, she I mean, in some ways she is stuck. She's a product of her upbringing. Um, and she, yeah. you know, she's she's the protege of her uncle against the entire rest of the family. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I mean, she, she's she's very brave to to go against all of that and do the right thing. Yeah, that was one thing I was thinking about for all of Zuel's scenes. Is I feel like that's an a character like excuse or explanation we get a lot is like. Um, not that it's unreasonable, but it's like a, a lot of times like a backstory for a character will be like, well, look at their family, look at like how they grew up. Like, and, and I think that can be a valid backstory. Um, but the thing I was really impressed with for Zuel is like, I actually felt what it must, like how she felt and like how, like I think Frances Harding did such a good job of communicating how lonely she was. Um, and how, like you said, she's against the entire rest of her family who would give her up in a heartbeat, as we see. And I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I think this was one of the most convincing versions of that backstory I've ever seen. Where even though I was obviously upset that Zuel did betray Neverfell a couple of times, I understood why she did it. And I, I feel like um, we, we were able to understand where she was coming from better than I sometimes do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And made even more impressive by the fact that we can't see her face and that Neverfell thinks the wrong thing about it every single time. And yet yeah. it's still so clear to the reader. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Um, and it's, and I think it's really important to have that arc of like, yes, she was a product of her time. And yes, you know, it was very difficult for her and you can see how difficult it is for her. And yet she still goes through with it and she still chooses the right thing in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like she's an example of what 
we were talking about Gulfstruck Island when we talked about this, but like Frances Harding doesn't let you write characters off very easily, you know, because my first impression of her, I was like, oh, she's bad news. Stay away from her. And now by the end of the book, I was like, oh, I hope Zuel makes it out okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, so Julie's saying, it's my first read, but Zuel started to walk to Neverfell when she visited at the palace one of the last times, but still had the threat pulling her. And yes, yeah, that's what I thought, because there, there are those moments where she like gives her a hug or holds her hand and, you know, like maybe it's acting, but maybe it's not. Um, and yeah, yeah, I feel like her, her arc is it's gradual, but it's definitely there. Yeah, I almost feel like um, Zuel was talking herself into believing that um, that it was just an act when maybe it wasn't for as long as she thinks it is. Like, um, kind of like Julie was saying, where some of the some of the times where she visits never fell, and yeah, she like hugs her, she goes along with it, and. You can see that Zuel is like, oh, I I'm just manipulating her. That's why I'm doing this. And it's like, but you also feel like you have a friend for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And anyone saying, I love how she was never certain which face to wear. Um, yes. Let me pull which, that one up. Yeah. And I, I love the moment where Neverful was like, no, I know you. And when your face is doing that, I know what it means, even though it's not, even though it doesn't represent like what you're actually feeling. Yes. Yes, I loved that as well. Because it shows that Neverfell can understand people. Like, mm -hmm. she obviously hasn't had a lot of practice because she grew up with, like, one person that she knew. Um, but she is really smart. And, yeah, I, I love, too, that she calls Zuel on, like, no, you're upset about this and you feel sorry that you did this to me. And Zuel's like, no, I don't. I don't have any feelings. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, yeah. Side note about the faces is I love the names for them. They were so fun, like <laughs> the ones that were, it's like, uh, oh, it was like baby deer gazing upon a dew drop at sunrise or something. <laughs> like world weary with a core of basic decency. Yes, <laughs> I loved that. That was a fun element. Yeah, like that's, I think I, like with um, the the beloved, and I feel like five there. I feel like Francis Harding just had so much fun coming up with all of them. Yes. I had that same thought. I was like, it reminded me of the the beloved descriptions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let okay. So let's talk about um, Master Grandpa, the only the one person who now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I. We don't spend a lot of time with him at the beginning, and so this was on this read. I was like, why do I have such like an emotional memory of like their relationship. And then we get to the end of the book and I'm like, oh yeah, that's why. <laughs> like, um, I think that I I really got a sense for how much, how much he cared about her, even though we don't see him that much. Um, so yeah, I, I really liked him. I love what he says to her at the end, which I'm sure is in our quotes that we're gonna share. Um, I love, oh my gosh, the, the part where he's being they're like besieging his his cheese tunnels and he's like well they're gonna think neverfell's here so i'm gonna give her time to escape and i'm like you grump i love you <laughs> yeah i really because i when we were going i didn't remember that we went back to him or that we ever saw more of him and i the whole time i was, reading, I was like i want more of him yeah um, but i feel like the the tiny scenes we get give us such a good impression of who he is yeah, and I feel like that's very fitting for his character because he is very gruff, but he does love her. So even though we get these little tiny moments, it's like you can see how much he cares about her. And um, yeah, I, I feel like he had a big impact in the book, even though he wasn't in that many scenes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about this while. Um... I love him too. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I kind of similarly to Grandable is like at the beginning, I was like, I like remember loving him. And I feel like that is out of all proportion to the number of scenes he's in. And then we see more of him. But he's another one that like, he, I mean, I think he pretty quickly realizes that he does actually care what happens to Neverfell. But he's kind of another one where um, he's like, I'm not your friend, Neverfell. And she's like, you are, though. And he's like, no, I'm not. And then like three pages later, he's like, so let's help you overthrow the nobility. Like, 
Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. I just loved him. I, I just have emotions. I don't really have like <laughs> anything thoughtful to say about him at this point, but yeah, like I just, and I, I love how selfless he is, even though he thinks he's not, he's, he thinks he's, um, he's that character who's always surprised that he does the right thing and like nobody else is <laughs> like, I love him so much. And yeah, I really, I loved his and Neverfell's relationship. Like their friendship is just like very heartwarming. And I like that we see Neverfell realize, I don't know, like just realize like some things about how he lives and, um, that she didn't really understand, like the thing about the eggs, and yeah. I love that yeah. he, like, he calls her out on her privilege. Um, yes, yes. Um, things with the eggs, and also when they're talking about um, the the murders, the the like the rehearsal mm -hmm. murders, um, and she's like, "No, nobody would do that," and he's like, "That's what you think. You think yeah. in the palace." Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I just love him as well. I think he's great, and he yeah, he like he he balances never felt. I feel like they're so good together because he is so cynical, understandably, um, mm -hmm. but he has that like hope buried somewhere deep, and it it you know so she brings it out of him, and he kind of grounds her a little bit, um, and I just love like the way he supports her. Um, I love the, the line where she's like, do you think I haven't noticed that you've been risking your life for me? I have noticed. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and kind of, kind of related, I guess, thematically to erstwhile. So one thing that I really love about this book um, is seeing seeing like kindness and compassion like rewarded in very concrete ways. Like the fact that Neverfell saved that servant's life. And that was the first time that anybody had ever stood up for one of them. And the the servants in the palace kept her alive. Like, you know, that was a huge help, which not that, not that like you have to be rewarded like that for doing the right thing. But I just find that very satisfying when like her compassion and her like refusal to be selfish is like, like characters will tell her like, oh, it's never gonna pay off for you, but like it does. And I really love that. Yeah, I'm saying he had a selection of faces. I think the drudges had like two or three faces and they were all positive emotions was how I understood it. Yeah, they have- um... So like they don't have a big range of emotions and they can't show sadness or anger, I think. Yeah, they had, I think they have five. Let me, I actually marked the quote where they're describing some of them. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, erstwhile had exactly five expressions, polite but stony calm with eyes lowered for slipping discreetly past his betters, respectful attentiveness for receiving orders, keen alertness when inspecting or inviting orders, humble remorse and fearfulness for receiving criticism or punishment, and just one smile for those times when an employer had a right to express a show of gratitude. This was not a day for smiles and none of the others would fit. So he stared at her with a blank, respectfully attentive face and could give her nothing more. It made him feel shabby, stupid, and angry. So, yeah, that was one of the ones I marked because I just like, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I love, because the servants, like we kind of don't really notice the servants much either. Um, but but they are there um, the whole time, and I, yeah. I also because I love the bit where the zookeeper is following her through the palace, um, and when he comes, everything's been cleared up. Um, yes. So, but it obviously it was the servants. Who else would it have been? Um, so I love that there. Yeah. Like, um, you know. Sorry. Go ahead. Was, no. Yeah. Just. Sorry, I I, I I didn't mean to interrupt. Um. I was going to say that that was one of the things I did remember from other reads. So it was really interesting this time to see the tiny little clues she leaves you, like the, what you're saying where things are always cleared up. Um, and I forget what some of the others were, but like just little hints that it's like people in the palace maybe. Um, yeah. So that was all I was going to say. I'm sorry for cutting you off there. Yeah. 
Yep. Okay, so let's talk. The next one on my list was the kleptomancer. Um, so, thoughts on the kleptomancer? <laughs> um, what a time. Like, I, yeah, truly an agent of chaos. Like, I love, I love the, like, whole concept of creating an unbeatable plan by not knowing what you're doing the entire time. Uh, like it's it's madness, but it works. And yeah, but it's, it's also just incredible because there's no way when he made the plan and wrote all the instructions for himself, there are so many variables involved in that um, and things he couldn't have predicted. And yet somehow he pulls it all off despite having no clue what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> or that, that part at the very end where he's like, oh, I've got Caverna and he's like, wish I knew what I was going to do with it. <laughs> like the one thing he didn't tell himself. Um, yeah. I thought he was so interesting and I, I couldn't figure out like if he was going to be like a help or a hindrance to never fell and what they were trying to do. And he's kind of like in the middle, he's just sort of like, he's doing his own thing, but he's obviously sympathetic, like more sympathetic to never fell and the drudges side. Um, but yeah, he, he was really, really interesting. I don't really know how I feel about him, clearly. Yes. <laughs> yes, I love the, the bit at the end where, I forget the exact line, but where the last note to himself is like, don't drink any more wine, you're, <laughs> you're on the verge of madness. Yeah. Um, and the, the whole cartographer thing was so interesting. And that was one of those things where like, I, I must have been 300 pages into the book when it clicked and I'm like, oh, like <laughs> Mad Hatter. And, um, or I think, I think when they, when they mentioned the tea party actually is when I, I got that. But there were so many things like that where I'm just so engrossed in the story that I don't stop and think. Like I didn't think about um, the, the Grand Steward being essentially the queen of hearts, mm -hmm. um, like off with her, off with her head because he's executing people all the time. Um, so that was just, yeah, it was like a, a fun little surprise where I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what this is a reference to. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I, yeah, what do you think happens to him after the end of the book? I, like, he loves Caverna so much that I, I would think he would stay there. Um, I hope he would be a better ruler than the Grand Steward would be. And I think there's even a hint that oh no because it's the um the inquisitor or whoever so he's he's gonna make her do the work <laughs> basically because yeah. she's good at it so yeah like i i can't imagine him leaving caverna but other than that i don't really know yeah, because his his last thing is like i'm gonna go off into a cave and never be seen again yeah. um, and <laughs> it's like all of that all of that plan for for nothing yeah, yeah. Yes. But Julia, this is also one you will like because it indirectly involves mothers. Yes, it does. <laughs> We're going to get Julia with the moms. Like, that's how this is going to work. Um, yeah, this is spoiler territory, just so you know. If that is a factor. Um, yeah, it is. It's kind of like a like a little bit of a letdown for him when he's finally achieved what he's been working towards for years. <laughs> And he's like, I'm wondering what I was gonna do with that. Like, yeah. it was. <laughs> and yeah, I j yes, and Erwin saying he talks about soothing Cabana, yeah. Um, which, yeah, I do, like. Do you think the cartographer, the rest of the cartographers? left or I, I think I mean I think they they kind of they stayed we are sort of told but I don't know they all I sort of felt sorry for the cartographers at the end because everyone else leaves and they're just sort of beaten back um and they're not evil the way like the rest of the children's are evil they no. just kind of get stuck squeaking they're scary but bats. it's <laughs> do you say squeaky like bats squeaking with their bats yeah 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 it's like they're they're scary but it's not actually their fault um yeah and like i also 
because they've been they've been so fixated on the underground passage or the the undiscovered passage sorry um so then once they find that it's like well are they going to use it that wouldn't make sense because they're they are also like so um in love with caverna it's like i can't really picture them going to the above ground world but like what do they do now (laughs) um yeah yeah, I just, in that last scene, I just felt sorry for them. They were like caught between the escaping drudges and the, the child of sins and were sort of just inadvertently stuck. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let's talk about um, Maxim Childerson. <laughs> we just both shake our head. <laughs> uh, what a piece of work. <laughs> Yeah, just the worst. Like <laughs> just the worst. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, like he. I don't know. Yeah, like he. Again, kind of like Zuel, but worse because he is the the worst. Like the way she kept trusting him and kept being like, "Oh, he's smiling at me. Oh, he's gonna help me." And like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's so interesting the fact that it's not just Neverfell who gets fooled by people's faces. Like everyone, even though they do the same thing, they everybody wants to believe that when somebody is showing them an expression, they mean it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think that that conversation that he has with Neverfell is very indicative of him as a character where she says, what's the use of owning it if you can't see it? And he says, what's the use of seeing it if you don't own it? And I just think that's him in a nutshell. Um, yeah, classic Francis Harding like car- character on one line. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like you know, you know that he's no good, but it's not until right at the end where the whole extent of his. Yeah. Yeah, like something, something's off about him, and you don't figure out till later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his connection to Madame Appleby, which I hadn't remembered. Yeah. Um, yeah, and she, she was so interesting. Like I, I know for a fact that the first time I read it, I was fooled by her, and I thought what Neverfell did. Um, and then when we find out what actually happened, <laughs> um, yeah, just oh, they're such good villains. I hate them so much. <sighs> yeah. Uh, she. Yeah. She's just. Yeah, I feel, I don't know, she, and I'm feeling like I'm struggling to express. I know, it's like we're, we're speechless at their evil. <laughs> yeah, like she, and it's a it's a throwaway line, but um, it's when Neverfell sees the mural of her mother and she's in manacles and it, it's never brought up again, but like, <sighs> that's like really disturbing. Yeah. And Mano Appleton is really evil. Yeah. Like the, just how, how like, it's not, it's like what she did obviously, but it's also how calm and collected she was about it and how like, well, I do my best face work when I'm ripping children away from their families. Like, um, just, just the, the fact that she was like so cool about it is I think part of what makes her so awful and so um, like effective as a villain. Cause it's not, like she's, it was premeditated, you know, she was very calculating about it. You and me both, Julie. I mean, not this time, I remembered her this time, but yeah, first time. Cause, cause she does such a good job. Like Francis Harding does such a good job of setting up just enough clues that you feel like, oh wait, I think I know what's going on and you do not. <laughs> I think someone who can construct a collection of faces called a tragedy range has to be suspicious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A fair point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I and the the moment where um, she's fighting Neville at the end, and Neville's like, "You're wearing my mother's face. I can't fight you. Take it off." And I. J- <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I I did not remember how she met her end. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Yikes. I also have to imagine trap lanterns big enough to eat. <laughs> I know. Well, like I don't think of them. 
Which is silly, they feed them grubs. I don't think of them as being, like, carnivorous in that sense, but... Yeah, I, mean, I was like, you know, I was imagining them, like, t- I don't know, like, tulip-sized, kind of, I guess. Yes, yeah. Um, but then, oh, wait. And then it's just, like, quiet. Like, immediately, I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, yeah, and I feel like she's... um on the mold of what we talked about with Lady Tamarind in Fly by Night, the way she's kind of fascinating, but also mm-hmm. just despicable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just the way that, the way that Neverfell keeps like talking to her and like keeps like trying to love her and <sighs> like she tries to love everybody. <laughs> I do think it's interesting that um, her and Maxim were like romantically involved. Cause I feel like that's not like, that's a very common like villain trope as you find out like two people are secretly in league and they're also lovers. But like, I don't feel like Francis Harding does that a lot. So I just, I don't know, for some reason that was something that stood out to me. Um, is it Zuel or somebody else who's like, I don't think they're just partners in crime. <laughs> like, I thought that was funny for some reason. <laughs> yeah, but I think they have an interesting dynamic as well because she clearly cares about him much more than he cares about her. Yeah. Yeah, I I have a quote about that that I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which... Yeah. yeah. And it's not and just like, that she was wrong, but... To, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was just gonna say it's it's so sad too that it's not just that Neverfell was wrong; it was that she was loving the person who is the reason she does not have a mother. Yeah. Um, what were you gonna say, Hannah? Sorry. Yeah, no, like similar to what you were saying before about how the clues are all there, like seven years, everything seven years, um, and it all seems like it all adds up, but then. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I also sort of on a tangent, not really rated. I love the moment where the Clapton Mountain was like, did I steal you when you were this big? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, I, I love the like little moments of of like humor because people don't remember things like when they when they break never fell out and, she, and they're like, come on, we got to get ready for the rebellion. And she's like, what rebellion? And they're like, oh, drink this. And she's like, oh, that rebellion. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And um, what's, the last one on the list was the Grand Steward, um, which Julie, you said you'd have thoughts on as well. Um. <sighs> yeah, like he's he's so scary, and I still somehow feel bad for him. Um, like, I think his death scene was actually, like, really poignant. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, the fact that Neverfell was there. And, yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. Because you do get the sense that the way he is and his cruelty is, at least in part, because of the way he's unnaturally extended his life. Um, which, obviously, obviously, that part is a choice he made. But I just... Yeah, I, I'm with I'm with Julie. <laughs> um, yeah, like he, he was so creepy, and obviously he had like he executed tons of people, and yeah, I still feel a little bit of sympathy for him at the end, um, which I think is partly influenced by the fact that he also cared about Neverfell a little bit, um, as as everybody does against their better judgment. <laughs> Yeah, but I didn't, I don't know, like when he, he kind of cared about Nerfell, but only in as much as she was useful to him. And the bit where he's thinking that, um, that he wants to see, um, like, gratitude on her face. Um, and he's like, oh, maybe I'll send something down to the drudges that'll make her happy. And it's so calculated. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I was thinking of the part two where he, like, as he's dying, he has that moment of 
pity for what's going to happen to her because one, with he, with him dead, she doesn't really have anyone to protect her. So there were little moments like that, but like, yeah, he, he is bad. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I put him in a different class of like antagonist than like Madame Apolline and Maxim, but he is still bad. But like, I somehow still feel bad about what happens to him. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like conceptually, it's a really interesting thing to explore. Yeah. yeah that's really interesting, Judy, about. Yeah, and it, again, it's always going back to like that Francis Harding thing of power and the the ways that power affects people and the lengths that people will go to to hold on to power, even like going completely mad and splitting themselves into two. <laughs> yeah, and the way that the poison worked to make you kill who you love most, and the way they turned that into a murder weapon was just like so smart and terrifying. Um, yeah, and it's especially terrifying with the um, what Erswell says about how when they're using it on the on the drudges, and they're like, "We're all each other is all we have um, for the drudges," and that even that even that they're taking away from us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that part too, where he says like, "This is the worst thing they've ever done to us because this is this is all we have." Like you said. Um, Yeah. And I, I think what makes me feel a little more sympathy for him as opposed to the others is that there is at least some element of he didn't choose everything that happened. Like he, he didn't know, I think, the consequences of like living the way he did. So it's not like he didn't care that he would become a cruel tyrant. Um, I'm not saying he didn't know any better because like... <laughs> You should have known something would happen if you if you live like this. But yeah, I think the fact that he did not intentionally choose to become this person, I think, is one of the things that made him a little more palatable to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like he, he must have started off like ruling well. And I think um, Maxim says in the court that, you know, we had 400 years of good leadership and 100 years of chaos. Um, yeah. That like like still the drudges are not treated well so clearly he wasn't a good ruler but right you know he he clearly started off as like a stable ruler um until he he extended himself too far i feel like um you know the line from lord of the rings where bilbo says i feel like butter that's been scraped over too much bread i feel like that sums up the grand steward yeah definitely Um, were there any other characters who you wanted to talk about? Um, I don't like one. Yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry, I keep... You go first, that's okay. Um, no, I felt like Borcast was interesting because I had forgotten that she ever came back. I thought mm -hmm. that we didn't see her again after that beginning scene um and she i mean she doesn't come back for long only long enough to blackmail them well but, right um, <laughs> she she shows up to drop a clue and then she's gone <laughs> yeah um i thought so too it's interesting as i'm looking through it's like oh i remember this feeling like a really large cast and it's not as much as i think um I think it was interesting that the Inquirer be comes back at the end as sort of like the lesser of two evils. Cause like, I did not like her. Like, I don't think we were supposed to. And it's just, I don't know. It's weird. It's like, I guess we're supposed to view her as, um, I was going to say like justice to the point of cruelty, but like, she also gets things wrong a lot. So I don't know if she just didn't care who she was blaming. Like, I don't know. I just think it was weird that we're so afraid of her for the whole book. And then the kleptomancer is like, all right, so you're, you're pretty good at this. You're gonna, you're gonna do my job for me. <laughs> yeah. I thought the inquirer was interesting. I like, I, I don't know what her motivations were. Um, you know, it's never really made clear. There's that bit at the end where she, 
is relieved to have orders to follow again. Um, so it's the that kind of thing of her kind of being a a tool rather than a an active person, which not that that excuses anything that she does. Um, but I yeah, I do. We I feel like we don't really get a sense for what drives her, except that I don't know. Maybe she's a, a the other side of the cartographers in some way that she cares about the the city and not really anything else yeah yeah and it's it's almost like by the end of the book by comparison <laughs> she shows up and you're like oh it's only her okay <laughs> versus um versus like some of the other antagonists um yeah she was interesting because we see her as an obstacle for most of the book and then at the very end we get just a tiny bit of insight into her character I like I like that the bit at the end was interesting with her when she well I we'll get to the quotes um but where she realizes that the city doesn't function without the drudges um mm -hmm. like you know we can't send drudge runners to find out where the drudges <laughs> have gone we can't get water and we can't yeah yeah so I feel like she's I don't know symbolically interesting in that in that way yeah. And, yeah. Okay, so yeah, those were all the all the characters on my list. Is there anything else that anyone wants to add <coughs> before we go to quotes? One thing I thought was interesting is I was trying to decide through the whole book <laughs> if Neverfell is just like a regular person. Um, and that's why her face seems so strange or if she's like a regular person, but extra expressive or like, do you know what I mean? Like I couldn't tell how much of people's reaction to her was just because it was so different or if there was actually something magical or like, I guess I kind of, I settled on, all right, she's like a regular above ground person, but she's a very expressive person. And so it made it like even more heightened. Um, not yeah, that that was, was like super important. Yeah, I was wondering that too, and I think I, I think I kind of landed on that she, she is a normal human, but she, she's never learned. Like most of us, learn to control our expressions in some, to some extent, even if it's not to the level of the characters. Um, but she, because she never knew that her face was doing that, she never would have learned to do that. Um, so she would be a, like particularly expressive. That's a really good point. I didn't think of that. I accept your headcanon. <laughs> <laughs> but, and because because when they when they come out, the the like shepherd or whoever it is that they meet kind of recognizes her as a as a human as well. So I think yeah. that's where I, that's where I landed. Yeah. And he reacts to her expressions, but he's not like falling over. <laughs> um I love that line and I, I know we're not in quotes yet, but it's relevant. I love that line about like when people when you see never fell smile it's like getting hit in the face with a big gold gong and i'm like <laughs> i love her so much yeah i think that's i think that's the reason that makes the most sense <laughs> i hadn't considered that yeah. well the other thing that i was wondering was are the other people human or, or like were they once human that fell into the city and then the magic of caverna changed them or are they some entirely different species or are they fairies like that's yeah at the end. i i got the feeling that they are human um and i kind of assumed it was like yeah a long 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 time ago they found themselves in caverna and for whatever reason um I, I assumed it was more that they had been away from the surface for so long that that made their faces not have expressions, but magic would also explain that. So I don't know exactly how it ended up there, but I kind of assumed that they were humans because the way they're described and everything, um, they seem to look like everybody else except for the faces thing. So I kind of assumed that that's how it started. Like over time, for whatever reason, they lost the ability to show emotions or their faces. 
yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that the idea of them being underground, like they're kind of ossifying in some way mm-hmm. and they're not capable of showing their feelings. Yeah. Yeah, because people aren't really meant to live underground like that. <laughs> you know, and people aren't really meant to, you know, drink wines that can r- remove their memory no. and weird cheeses. And <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the, the imagery for the wines being like semi-sentient was terrifying like it was so cool though like when they're talking about the children's in laboratories and how um how they were sneaky and like you had to watch yourself and how they were always waiting it's like the the way they were personified i think was very effective <laughs> very creepy <laughs> And, and with the cheese as well, I, you know, the bit that confused me was when um, when the kleptomancer was like, I have all this cheese buried under the palace and it's going to explode if you don't follow my instructions. <laughs> but Nevelle told us that you have to poke the cheese with a needle. She didn't say, because I, I then went back and checked because I was confused. She didn't say a specific frequency, but does that mean that in between the rest of his plans, the kleptomancer has been coming back and back in <laughs> I love that image. Did it say? Yeah, because he sent Stackfalter certain, like the same kind. I don't know. I mean, he could. Like, <laughs> I I don't know either. I guess I I guess I had thought maybe it was a slightly different kind of cheese, but no, he actually says the variety. That's interesting. Um, one other thing that talking about the true delicacies reminded me of is I feel like there's also this interesting part of the book that's like about like memory itself and how like forgetting something bad doesn't mean it didn't happen like where Zuel wants to take her memory so that she doesn't remember hurting Neverfell and Neverfell's like you can't like that's that's not the same as it not happening um and Neverfell ref- like escaping from the kleptomancer because he's going to take her memories although when that happened I was nervous because I'm like his plans are like very very like meticulous i was worried that she was gonna ruin something by like escaping with her memories um but it turned out she was right so yeah i don't know if you had like thoughts on that but i just think the idea of being being changed by what you witness and how you can't just like erase that like once neverfell has seen the undercity um yeah and and she doesn't she doesn't want that erased Mm -hmm. (laughs) that is the question (laughs) Um, and does he, do they dig it out after the end of the book? I, like, <laughs> the, the explode, like, I need to know. I have questions about the cheese bomb, Francis Harding. <laughs> like, uh. um, yeah, no, I, you're right about the memories. Um, and, yeah, the idea, and with the Nanafel, the way she remembers the outside as well, and she knows that things are illusions. Um, it's like, just because you can't remember it, it still leaves its mark on you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall we go on to quotes? Yeah. I feel like we're going to have a lot. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to start? Sure. Um, So this one is about, this is erstwhile talking, and he's talking about the court people. Um, You sure you don't know what court folk are like? Erstwhile gave up and dropped his gaze. Looking at Neverfell was just too jarring. They pull people about like puppets, particularly the older ones. Don't trust anybody over 150 years old, particularly if they look 30. Anybody who gets that old in Caverna loses something, and they don't get it back. They can't feel properly anymore. They're hollow inside, and all they got left is a hunger, a hunger to feel. They're like great big trap lanterns, all blind gaping need, and thousands of teeth with decades to come up with tricks and schemes. Yep, I had that one too. Especially the um, don't trust anyone over 150, I feel like that's just good advice. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that, like, one of the other kind of, like, subtle ideas in this book is, like, don't unnaturally extend your life. <laughs> like, um, And I love how that quote shows that, 
like erstwhile and the other drudges it's like they're just as smart and thoughtful as everyone else mm -hmm. and they can't they don't look like it because of the way their faces have been restricted and it just like yeah i i love i love that mm -hmm. So I had um, just a classic about the Grand Steward. At one o'clock, the ever logical right eye Grand Steward woke up to discover that during his sleep, his left eye counterpart had executed three of his advisors for treason, ordered the creation of a new carpool, and banned limericks. Worse still, no progress had been made in tracking down the kleptomancer, and of the two people believed to be his accomplices, both had been released from prison, and one had been appointed food taster. Right eye was not amused. He had known for centuries that he could not trust anybody but himself. Now he was seriously starting to wonder about himself. <laughs> banning limericks is just like the cherry on top <laughs> like what happened um yeah this one i i love too this is like when they're talking about the assassin <laughs> one of the assassins that goes after neverfell following neverfell should have been easy she was distinctive undisguised and guileless and since she kept glancing over her shoulder at the wonders of the court her unsuspected shadow had ample opportunity to observe her thoughts and intentions writ large across her face soon however he was learning an important lesson being able to read somebody's thoughts is all very well but if they have the attention span of a summer adult gnat this does not necessarily help you guess what they will do next <laughs> and i i love every time they would like put never falls faces into words. So she's like, maybe I'll run over here. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's sparkly. It's like, she's just, uh. Yeah, I just, I love every moment where he's like, we never fell. We can never predict what you're <laughs> going to do. Um, and I, I love when she realizes that as well and starts using that to her own advantage. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I like want to know the specific reason that happened. <laughs> like, what what happened in a limerick that offended him? Yeah, okay. I've got the great outside that had filled Nenfell's thoughts had noticed her and judged her. It had found her wanting. No, worse than that, it had screamed in horror and disgust and fled from her. Her neck was bruised, but far more painful was the thought of kind big sister Zuel hitting out at her. She just. <laughs> Yeah. Um, this one's about the kleptomancer. <laughs> Glancing back at the thief, Neverfell could see him standing in a lantern light, his expression still blank as new slate, one hand rubbing bemused at the back of his neck. For the first time, it occurred to Neverfell that perhaps he did not know what to do with stolen goods that did not stay where he put them, but instead screamed, ran around, and threatened to eat his correspondence. Perhaps he did not really know what to do with people at all. <laughs> Yeah, and that's when he's like, I'm not trying to hurt you. I just saved your life. Now stop all this running. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, yeah, the whole bit about the the drudges that um, never felt stared, fascinated. In her head, she knew that what she was watching must be backbreaking and dangerous. And yet it was hard to feel anything for the workers. They just seemed so dogged, placid, and docile, a hundred heads, all with the same face. Watching them, it was hard to believe that they had individual thoughts and feelings, that they were not just contented cogs in a giant machine like those turned by the water wheels below. But then, straight away on the next page, um, quite suddenly, everything changed before her eyes. The figures on the wall ceased to be ants and became people. Suddenly, she could imagine the strain on their shoulders, their broken nails, the chill of spray, the stomach-twisting awareness of the hungry drop below. How had she been stupid enough to think that these people were not grief-stricken or cold or weary or angry? They just did not have the faces to show any of these things. They had always been denied such expressions, and now, at last, Neverfell was starting to understand why. Yeah. Is it is it the person who falls that makes her realize yeah. that? Yeah. I know that was, that was a really good part. I mean, not good, but you know what I mean. Very effective. Um... And, yeah, I also yeah, I feel like it's a the quotes are alternating between like really deep and dark and just complete <laughs> nonsense. Yes, which is very on brand for this book and for her books in general. <laughs> um, I really love this description. This is the Club Answer again about Caverna. Um, this is like kind of a long paragraph, but I'm going to read it anyway. 
It draws you in. You twist your mind into new shapes. You start to understand Caverna, and you fall in love with her. Imagine the most beautiful woman in the world, but with tunnels as her long, tangled, snake-like hair. Her skin is, da is dappled in trap lantern gold and velvety black, like a tropical frog. Her eyes are cavern lagoons, bottomless and full of hunger. When she smiles, she has diamonds and sapphires for teeth, thousands of them, needle thin. But that sounds like a monster. She is. Caverna is terrifying. This is love, not liking. You fear her, but she is all you can think about. That is what it means to be a cartographer. That was my life for 15 years. It's like, ooh. <laughs> no wonder he's kind of messed up. <laughs> Yeah, I love. I didn't. I don't think I marked it, but that the whole description of Caverna as like a walnut and the way the cartographers go mad trying to bend their minds around it. Yeah. We've got um sneaking off. Where are you going to do something I can't do if I'm being watched? I don't quite have a plan, but I think now I sort of have a plan for how to make a plan for coming up with a plan. <laughs> and I can't think about it too hard right now, or it won't work. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the fact that her whole strategy is like, I'm nuts. Like nobody will guess what I'm gonna do because I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um yeah, I love that. Oh, I love this part where like we see that Zoel is really starting to understand Neverfell. You're going about it the wrong way, said Zoel suddenly. Really? Yes. There was a long and hollow pause, during which Neverfell looked from countenance to countenance and could read neither of them. I understand Neverfell, you see. For Neverfell, it is as if other people are part of her. When she believes they are in pain, it hurts her, like a wound in a pretend limb. So right now, she is in pain for all the people she saw in the Undercity. There was a pause. The countenances of uh, spoilers removed <laughs> moved smokily and uncertainly from one expression to another, as though they were turning over this unfamiliar concept. Sorry, I was like, I don't know if people want, like if Julia's still watching, I didn't want to give away too much, even though I know she's staying here for the spoilers, but. Um, yes, I love that line. Love, not liking. Yeah, and and Julia and Awen, if you have favorites, feel free to share as well. Um, so, Madame Aveline, what would happen if drudge children were taught unhappy faces? They would grow up considering that they might be unhappy. They might look around and see unhappiness on each other's faces, and their own unhappiness would grow. If they were a happy face for long enough, on the other hand, they are much more likely to believe, in the end, that they are really happy. And there's no difference between being happy and believing you are happy, is there? Which, I guess that's like some, that's 1984, like, <laughs> all the unhappy words. Kind yes! Of. Yeah, and like when I think right after that, never feels like there is a difference, and I can't explain it to you, but it matters. <laughs> like, yeah, um, and then this part which we kind of talked about earlier, when never feels says, "What don't I understand? I know you've been lying to me, probably about lots of things, and I know there are probably plans inside plans inside plans, and I'm just a pawn, and that's all I ever was, even back when we first met. And it doesn't matter because you're my friend. You're my friend, and you're in trouble." All this while you've been miserable and I've been too stupid to notice. Now, please, please tell me what's going on. Like when she's like, you're my friend anyway. I just <sighs> never felt too pure for this world. Like <sighs> chaotic cinnamon roll. Yeah. Looks like we're giving Julia just enough spoilers to get her interested. So perfect. <laughs> I think that's that's most of mine. There's obviously um, Miss Granville's last line um, about Neverfell's face. Um, spoiled? I'll spoil them. He took hold of her chin and examined her. A bit sadder, maybe. A bit wiser. But nothing rotten. You're just growing yourself a rind at last. Still a good cheese. Which I just like. <laughs> Miss Granville just comes back in the last scene to make us all emotional. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And it's about cheese. <laughs> like... I know. Um, yeah, I only have a, a couple more. Every one of Maxim Childress's small, dark smiles she'd carefully designed for him at one time or another to suit his face and his character. And now these smiles had more power over her than anything else in the world. It was humiliating, a face smith caught on a hook of her own devising. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I love the through that to growth, yeah. And then one of the other ones was is like very close to the end. This is my last one, I think. Um when they reached the parting of the ways at the end of the at the edge of the desert, it seemed to him that she thanked him, though he could not understand her words. She was not pretty, but her face showed her heart so clearly one could not help but understand her. As she clenched the grass between her bare toes, her smile was like the sun swimming through blue eternities. Yeah. The power of like even the way you don't need language, you just the power of never felt space basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and the way that like really understanding somebody is it like transcends how attractive they are it's mm -hmm. um or or how like not that like never feel she's like 12 so not that she's like supposed to be attractive but do you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what she looks like it matters that like you you understand her um yeah yeah i've got yeah i've got one last one um she was not undamaged, however, and she knew it. No food or drink had passed her lips, but she had drunk deep of the truth, and now it could not be flushed out of her system with bitter cordials, or washed from her skin, or picked out of her hair. Which... Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love how um, when she's con trying to stop Zoelle from taking her own memories, um, like, she gets... I think it's it's kind of a rare moment of not not that Neverfell doesn't get upset, but it's like a different kind of emotion where she's like, you don't know what it's like to have holes in your head and not know where they came from, like to not know who you are, like you don't know what you're doing, and I do, and I have to live like this. Like I thought that was um, kind of like you were like that quote you just shared. It's like she understands better than most people. Um, that forgetting something doesn't make it go away and that you shouldn't do that lightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Does anyone have any final thoughts um, before we just introduce next month's book? Let me get that. Sorry, can you see what a mess my stuff is over here? <laughs> Hopefully not. There we go. All right, yeah. Cara, do you want to, do you want to introduce it? <laughs> Julia! <laughs> there is no escape. <laughs> um, listen, I do love Guinevere, and you know that's not the point. <laughs> this is a good question. Um, I'm not sure I can help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never fell. I know her name is super interesting. So yeah, any? I, yeah, like I, it's not a perfect book, but I feel like I cannot be objective about it. Um, yeah, I don't know, there's some, like it is, it's very long, um, potentially longer than it needs to be. Um, and it, like, there are some things like I wish that Master Grandable had told Never Fell earlier. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like the amount that I love it outweighs anything I could possibly say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that I would change or I think could have been done better um like because it is long but I feel like it's as long as it needs to be um so I don't know if I would even necessarily say it. I think it should be shorter um yeah I also I would have liked Grandable to tell her earlier I guess like I, I guess like I would have liked maybe never felt to have um have help earlier maybe like for for her allies to kind of come to come to come together a little earlier um but even that it's like i understand why for the story that that didn't happen like it was more effective um and i do like that we got to see never felt doing things on her own and then realizing she doesn't have to do everything on her own but she's still very capable 
Um, I'm glad you enjoyed it too, and that you got yeah. to. You have criticisms, Julie. Um, yeah. Uh, anything you guys in the comments would want to change? I was about to say something, and now I've completely forgotten what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's not your fault. Um, I have no idea. Oh, um, I was reading some of the negative reviews and they were like, it's too weird, it's too dark. I don't know what's going on. And I was like, no, but that's why I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like much like I said about Gulfstruck Island is I think personal taste is always going to be a factor. And so I could see people not liking this because it's just a type of story. Like the the weirdness is too much. But I feel like... I feel like in terms of what you like in books, like the character development is great. The writing is great. The setting is great. Like the plot and themes, like everything is done really well, I think. And so it just comes down to, are you on board for how wacky and strange it is? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I figured you meant. Um, yeah. So she didn't just like drop into the tunnels. She was actually carried there. Yeah. That's a good, good point. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it is long, especially for a middle grade. It's very long. Um, and this is a great example of how I never pay attention to pacing. <laughs> ever i should say almost never but yes yes um once again i feel like this is a perfect counter example for people who think that adult fantasy is like automatically smarter i'm like excuse me <laughs> francis harding could write circles around some of these people yeah but i still just I know their class is middle grade, but I don't know that they are written. And like they have child protagonists, but I don't know that a middle grade audience, like I, I, I was a bit younger than middle grade when I first read Fly By Night, but I really, really struggled. Um, and I was just actually speaking to someone else who said that they tried Frances Harding when they were, you know, 11 or 12 and didn't like her at all. And I was saying, no, you should go back and have another go now because I didn't understand her writing until I was a bit older as well. Um, yeah. So I do wonder whether, not that it's fake middle grade, because middle grade can be complex, obviously, but I don't know. Complex yeah, about that. I feel like it just points to how arbitrary um, age ranges are, like, because she's, she's, she considers herself a children's writer and like in terms of awards and things, but like I have seen her books shelved all over the place. <laughs> like I've seen them in middle grade. I see them in young adult. I've even seen them in just like general fiction sections. So what is the truth? Yeah. yeah. And I, I do think that, um, that like, writing like plain writing style can be a stylistic choice it doesn't necessarily correlate to age range but yeah there are definitely like like vocabulary words like you said that i think a lot of like probably middle graders wouldn't wouldn't know um i don't know yeah like i, I just i don't know like my sisters are still young as well but i can't see myself giving them these books for a number of years yet um yeah like yeah i don't know but then again like some of her book like verdigree deep i would say is much more it's still like complicated and dark in terms of its themes um but is more feels more middle grade in terms of comprehension i guess I don't know. If no one else has anything to add, Cara, do you want to introduce next month's? 
Yes. So our book for next month, so our the live show will be about halfway through February, um, is Cuckoo Song. This one is much shorter. Oh, okay. Not as short as I thought. <laughs> it's about 400 pages instead of 500. Um, yeah. So, and this one is, I think... I think this one leans more into the creepy stuff than some of her others. Like I would classify this as kind of closer to Vertigray Deep um, in terms of the tone, but um, I'm trying to think how I can even summarize this. Basically our, the main character Triss wakes up after an accident and everything is just a little bit wrong. Like her parents aren't treating her the same way. Her sister seems angry at her and she doesn't remember anything that happened. Um, says she is insatiably hungry. She keeps waking up with leaves in her hair and her sister seems terrified of her. When it all gets too much and she starts to cry, her tears are like cobwebs. Um, so yeah, this is definitely more on like the creepy side, but I have only read this one once and I remember thinking it was really good. Um, this is also like a more historical book that she did. I don't remember what year it is, but yeah, it, it just did. Edward, Edwardian setting, right? I think it is Edwardian. Yeah, that's the general. One of the ones that I've never read, so. Um, I'm excited to. One of the reasons I have not picked it up is because it sounds terrifying. Look and at that cover! Yeah, it's it's like quite creepy in parts. There's a couple things I remember where, um, yeah, like they they have stood out in my memory. Um, but it, it's a really good one. And I, like I said, I have read it once before, but it's only once, and it's been a long time. So I'm very excited to hear. Um... Yeah. Julia, <laughs> next two are both historical. This one and the lie tree. This is your time. You should you should join. Yes, it's really good. And I'm glad, Awen, that you already love this one. Um, yeah, I remember really loving this one as well. Um, so yes, that's gonna be our, our next pick. And again, keep an eye on um, mine and Hannah's social media, which um, all of her links are in the description box already. And it's probably gonna be around, I would guess around February 13th. Let me see, actually, is that? Is that right? Yeah, probably around then, but we will officially announce that later. Um, okay, yes, and, that's and that's what that's what I remember about it as well. It's kind of like Bird Degree Deep. It's like creepy in an enjoyable way, not in like a, I wish I'd never read this kind of way. Yes, join us, Julia. <laughs> Trying to remember if there's any uh, notable moms in this one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that'll be, that'll be a good time. All right. So then I think that is everything. So thank you so much to Julia and Awen and Julia for joining us. Um, and to anyone else who watches this back later on, um, I'm, I'm so glad that you read with us and joined in with us and yeah. Yes. Thank you for putting up with our, our long <laughs> monologues about why this is a flawless book no. um yeah thank you guys yay I'm so glad to have you glad you could all right all right so we will see you guys next time <laughs>